Good morning, everybody. So um, the story I'm going to tell you uh, starts back um, at this place. This is Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's Medical Center um, in the 1970s, where um, I was doing my, uh, my studies. And I was in my third year of medical school. Rush was an interesting place because I don't know how many of you know Chicago. Um, it's, uh, it's sort of the elite medical school kind of in, uh, in downtown Chicago. And elite meaning, you know, kind of in its own view of who it took care of and how it took care of people. And it was very interesting at the time because, you know, I was very naive to lots of issues. But one of the fa fascinating things about Rush was that everything was divided into both into private and public floors. And um, it was sort of the old model where, you know, there were two OB floors and there were lots different medical floors. And it depended on whether you had a private doctor and private insurance or whether you had uh, Medicaid and you were, you know, publicly insured where you got to go. And Rush had a very high vi view of itself. And basically, um, it had a, a suite where if the president ever came to Chicago and was injured or got sick, um, this suite was sort of, uh, was reserved for dignitaries. And so it was just that kind of a place. And um, one night, I was on my OB rotation. And one night, one of the nurses, oh, by the way, the, me the, res the medical students mostly worked, as you could imagine, on the public floors. So one of the, one of the nights I was on, one of the nurses came up to me and said, um, could I help her distribute medications? And I said, well, that's not really something that medical students do. And she said, well, I have 36 patients on the floor, and I'm the only nurse on the floor. And I said, well, you know, I'm glad to help any way I could. I mean, you know, as a medical student, you can't really do too many things to help people. So I was happy to be able to sort of pitch in and help. But one of the bizarre things was as we got into this conversation, and I was going on rounds with her and trying to distribute the medications, she explained to me that the nursing staff on the private floor was always fully staffed, but if there was ever shortages, they would always take them off the public floor. But of course, the public floor was where all the sick people were. So here we were with 36, 36 very sick, um, either prepartum or postpartum patients, and, um, and one nurse to sort of cover. So I did what any good you know, medical student would do who'd grown up in a family as a fighter for social justice, and I stole all the nursing schedules off the two floors. And um, I counted up, and this is a photograph of the actual card that I still carry around at home. It's still there. And, um, and basically, I counted up the nursing schedules to see what it looked like. And as you can see, one of the things I found was in the evening shift, which was sort of in the middle there, there were 44 RNs on the, pri on the private floor and only 21 on the public floor, seven Jones. And at the night shift, there were 38 RN shifts for the, for the week and only 20 for the, um, for the public floor. So I figured, well, what do you do when you have this kind of information? You take it to somebody who can do something about it. So I brought it to the vice president of nursing, and I said, look at this. This is crazy, you know? And they said, we know this. This is the way we schedule the nurses. And I said, but it's not fair. You know, the sickest patients are on the public floor. They said, well, we know this. It's OK. Don't worry about it. There's plenty of nursing staff. We just have extra nursing staff on the private floor. So then I brought it to the dean. And I said, you know, this is crazy. I'm being asked as a medical student to deliver medications with the nurses. This doesn't really make any sense. How could that be that that was happening? And um, so anyway, to, to uh, make the point that no bad deed goes unrewarded, um, that year, Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's was basically starting the construction of the first national center for, of excellence in nursing. And you start thinking, like, so what does this mean that a place like this can become like a model for the rest of the country? And so um, my understanding of what happens in these situations is that if you ha give unequal care, meaning that people are not getting the same level of care, that basically it's a setup for bad things to happen. And bad things did happen on this floor, and which takes me to the next part of my story. So about a week later, I'm on my rotation, and I'm scrubbed into a cesarean section. And in those days, C-sections were all done under general anesthesia. 
and it was kind of a, a, a thing for the OBs to see how fast you could deliver the baby. So they'd scrub the mom's belly and everybody would be ready and the mask would be right here and they'd go, okay, go. And they'd put the mother under anesthesia and the babies would be delivered literally in like three to four minutes. Because if you didn't deliver the babies, they'd come out, they'd come out all, you know, floppy because they'd, they would get <clears throat> the same general anesthesia that the mother had. So one day I'm scrubbed into a C-section and they prep the baby, they open up the, the mother's belly, the uterus is exposed, and the doctor walks away from the table. And in the corner of a room, another doctor comes over and with a whole, uh, a whole tray full of syringes and starts drawing bloods, draws, from, draws a blood from, from uh, the artery, from the carotid artery, draws blood from the uterine artery, draws blood from all these veins, and is collecting all of these tubes that's going on. And after 11 minutes, they deliver this baby who should have been delivered in three minutes, and the APGAR is like two and three. And then I go, <clears throat> and I'm thinking like, well, I don't know, I guess this must have been some, some problem. and never really thought about it, but about three or four days later, the same thing happened again, and the same guy was standing in the corner of the room. So after this happened, I started asking questions like what was going on. And it turns out that this doctor was doing experiments on black women who basically were unconsented, knew nothing about it, and was, de was delaying the delivery of these babies for up to 10, 12 minutes. And they were coming out floppy, like you would expect. So I did what every good medical student would do. I Xeroxed the patient's charts. And, um, and I wanted to make sure that people had actually been consented. So I went and talked to the patients on my own and said, did you know that this stuff was happening? So this is kind of ballsy for a third year medical student. But um, so what happened was um, I went to the dean. I, first I went to the department chairman and I told him about this. He said, oh yeah, we know. There's nothing, no big deal. You know, the, the babies are all okay. I said, well, the one I saw yesterday is in the neonatal ICU. I said, so I don't know if that really means that it had anything to do with this, but it doesn't seem like this is okay to me. So um, they said, well, how do you know? And I said, well, here's all the charts. He said, you copied the charts? So he said, I have to report you to the president of the medical center because, you know, you can't go around copying people's charts and you don't have any right to be talking to these patients. So I got suspended from medical school. So I went to one of my advisors and, um, and this guy was a radiologist, but he was a real activist. And he said, well, you know, the only way you're going to get your job back is if you go to the newspapers. So this is what happened in the Chicago Defender, which was the, which was the uh, black newspaper. Me and one other medical student went to the newspapers and told the story about all of the illegal experiments that were going on on these black women. And um, we were immediately reinstated because the next day it would have said medical students who revealed this experiment basically were fired. Um, and then, but nothing really happened with the Chicago Defender because that's only the black newspaper. But when it hit the Chicago Tribune, which is the big Chicago newspaper, that's when all the stuff started to happen. And we actually formed one of the first human experimentation committees that actually um, were formed anywhere in the country because this was the time when people started really talking about informed consent and experimentation. And so we had this incredible, which became a national model, sort of human experimentation committee to make sure that things like this didn't happen again. But what's the moral of the story? So the first thing that I would leave you with is, you know, this thing which I took a picture of out of Grand Central Station, if you see something, say something. You know, we are, we become complicit in these things if we don't speak out when we see <clears throat> injustices in the healthcare setting. And the other thing was, you know, an institution's reputation, which is all we all live on, we all just live on our reputation, is only as good as it, the care it gives to the most troubled patients. It really doesn't matter what happens um, to, to the people who get great care. What really happens is what matters to everybody in the institution. And the other thing I learned is that it often requires public disclosure, which a theme I'll come back to, in order for things to change. And finally, um, if people aren't all held to the same standards of care, what happens to people who are poor and who have the weakest voices to speak out is really um, horrible. So let me talk a minute about health disparities. So 
there are lots of reasons why people get unequal care, right? It can be because of your language. It can be because of your race. It can be because you're not well educated. You could have disabilities. You could be blind. There's all these things that can interfere with people getting good health care. Um, but the interesting thing about it is researchers keep trying to figure out which of these things really causes disparities. And one of the things that gets me the angriest when we talk about racial disparities is people keep saying, well, it's not really race, it's insurance. It's not really race, it's education. It's not really race, it's language. But actually, it's all of those things. And the more of those things you have working against you, sort of the worse it is. So these things don't work independently, right? Because if you're poor, that increases your risk of having inadequate access to health care. If you're uh, Latino, it increases your risk of being uninsured by almost threefold. And if you live in Hunts Point in the South Bronx, it almost triples your chances of growing up with asthma. So all of these things, sort of where you live, your language, all these things act in concert. And so we stopped trying to figure out a long time ago when we were dealing with disparities, like what is it? It's all of the things. And the more of these things you have working against you, the harder it is for you to get good health, to end up with good health and good health care. So the more risk factors you have, the greater your chances of having poor health care access, health care quality, and poor health care outcomes, which means overall poorer health. And so the story goes on that somewhere <clears throat> around the mid to late 1990s, I had what some would call um, a, uh, I don't know, a midlife, a midlife professional crisis. And it went something like this. We had started two residencies where we were training lots of medical, uh, sorry, lots of residents. And this was all going on, um, you know, in the Bronx and in the Lower East Side. And we started looking at health statistics. And there's this article that came out, which I wish I could find, but I can't, um, in the New York Times that basically said, you know, health care is not getting better for people in, in, uh, that live in, in poor parts of, the, of New York City. And, you know, you could look at charts like this and look around, you know, 2000 or whatever, and you see that, like, nothing's really happening great around diabetes. And in some cases, things are getting better, like with stroke, but the disparities between what's happening to um, African Americans, in this case, up here, and Latinos and whites and Asian Americans um, right here, you know, the disparities don't get better, but yet some of the statistics seem to be improving. So whether it's that nothing's getting better or things are getting better but disparities aren't improving, that was sort of the story um, that was happening. And so one day we got a notice that the Center for Disease Control of all places, right, the people that make sure our air and water are okay and, all, and, and are responsible for infectious and communicable diseases, is putting out a request for proposals to deal with the issue of disparities. And we're thinking like, so what does the CDC have to do with disparities? Well, it turns out that people were, were putting out these articles that basically showed that healthcare disparities were the number one cause in this country of premature death and disability, more than any other disease. That if you took all of the African American and Latino people and looked at all of the diseases they got at earlier ages and, early, and in earlier stages of their life, it actually had more of an impact on, death and, on premature death and disability than cancer and heart disease. And, million, and millions of life years, you know, wrapped up in the fact that we're not be able to get everybody to sort of the same level, achieve the same level of health. And so a, a plan was put together um, that sort of started with looking at individuals and sort of did the same thing that, we, that I kind of think about in terms of my own practice, right? So we deal with individuals on a single basis, like how are we going to educate people about what's going on in the healthcare system? But at the same time, going all the way over to the other side, like what are we going to do to change policies that allow these kinds of things to go on in our society and this kind of disparity to exist? So one of the first things we did was we took the literature from, you know, from actual published studies in the medical literature, and we abstracted these things, and we started showing them to people in the community. And so these are some of the slides that we developed all the way back then. Um, and I'll just whiz through these really quickly. There's a lot of them. But I just want to give you a flavor for what this sort of disparity picture 
looked like when we started talking about it. So, and this was just on cardiovascular disease, right? Because that's what the CDC, we, we decided that we were going to put in a grant for, to reduce disparities on uh, diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So we started by telling people about cardiovascular disease. Okay, 1993 article, the rate of coronary artery bypass procedures is lower among African Americans than among whites. 1997, um, people, uh, African Americans are less likely to get coronary revascularization, particularly bypass surgery, and it's most pronounced amongst those predicted to benefit the most from the procedure, and all of this resulting in lower survival rates in blacks. I'm just looking at the highlighted um, pieces here. In this study by Shulman, which was an amazing study, um, blacks were only 60% as likely to be referred for cardiac cath as whites. And black women were only 40% as likely to be referred um, as the white men who were referred the most. So in this study, um, 1989 from JAMA, whites underwent significantly more angiography and coronary artery bypass grafting procedures and had more angioplasty. In this study, 33% fewer cardiac cath, 64% fewer revascularization procedures after myocardial infarction. Um, better adherence to drug or diet regimen. The better the patient's education is, if we're to minimize the number of hospital admissions for decompensated heart failure, they looked at, at education. They realized like, okay, education is a factor in predicting outcome. And lower odds of procedure use were found for African Americans and Latino patients for most types of insurance. And disparities were almost absent amongst privately insured, okay. Um, and then finally, you know, you had studies like this with all kinds of things coming out, and this one was picked up in the Associated Press. Minorities lag behind whites in the United States on nearly every health measure, from life expectancy and disease rates to health insurance, access to care, and all of that was put out in a report by Commonwealth Fund, which documented widespread disparities. So disparities were almost ubiquitous. So roll this forward now, and last year when we started the Department of Family Medicine, I got requests from four departments to come and give grand rounds. So the first one I got was from the Department of Surgery. And so I said, well, why would you call on me in family medicine to give surgical grand rounds? Like, what, I, what am I going to talk about? And they said, well, talk about anything you like. I said, OK, I'm going to talk about health disparities. So I didn't really know anything about surgical health disparities because I hadn't really studied them. So I went and I Googled literally health disparities and surgery and this these were the slides that I showed to and, and I sort of dumbed them down the same way but not realizing that um, not trying to be insulting but I basically used the same technique that I used when we were talking to the community so I abstracted these things 2009 Journal of Clinical Oncology okay hospital factors and racial disparities in mortality after surgery for breast and colon cancer so black patients compared with whites had a five-year overall survival rates for sur breast surgery that were 8% fewer, 4% um, fewer for colon cancer. Like, why would surgical survival rates be lower? And I just started flashing these things. Breast cancer disparities, unanswered questions, incident rates for breast cancer lower in blacks. Black, black women with breast cancer have higher mortality. And then I said, well, let's see how many other things. Prostate cancer. Black men were less likely to undergo lymph node dissection than white men. Among men with poorly differentiated prostate cancer, if you don't undergo lymph node dissection, you have worse survival. So why would that be? Urology, 2009, black men more likely to receive non-surgical treatment to be of low socioeconomic status. And non low, low SES and non-surgical treatment are associated with a greater risk of death. Pancreas cancer, black patients were as likely as white to show resectable disease, yet were less likely to get surgery, adjuvant or primary chemotherapy and or radiation. Compared with Medicaid recipients, non-Medicare Medicaid enrollees were more likely to receive surgery and the uninsured were less likely to receive adjuvant therapy. So insurance matters, right? Disparities in esophageal cancer, outcomes of patients with rectal cancer, early stage lung cancer, this is what I went through in detail with, all, with the surgeons. And even appendicitis, more likely to have ruptured appendices and stay in the hospital longer. So the moral of the story is you can literally Google anything.
and what you get back when you Google it and put in the word disparities are all the studies that show that for everything you look at, just like we knew 20 years ago, for everything you look at, there are disparities in care. So there's something really sad about healthcare disparities. And this is what's really sad about it, is that we actually are getting healthier as a nation, but we're doing very little to reduce the disparities. So this is life expectancy at birth, and you can see that the lines stay pretty much parallel. Um, the green line, which is black males, takes that dip in the middle, which is really due to the, to the HIV epidemic, and then starts coming back again. But maybe you could convince yourself that these lines are converging a little bit. But look at that time period, 35 years. And we're not really getting, achieving a, a real major reduction in disparities. This one's really sad because it's heart disease rates. And if you look at the top two lines, the green line is black males, the next line below it are white males, the disparities are actually worsening. Anybody have any idea why disparities would be worsening? Every study shows that the disparities in, in heart disease are actually worsening. Why? Because in 1980, we really didn't have anything to do for people that required high-tech, high-cost procedures. And the more technology comes into this stuff, the worse the disparities get. So all of a sudden we have angioplasties and balloons and we got left ventricular assist devices and we have all these other things and people die because they don't have access to the same kinds of stuff as everybody else. Five-year cancer survival rates, lines are parallel. And even when you look at procedures and tests and people that have studied those things over time, the lines pretty much stay parallel. So remember, this is what we saw when we're looking at New York City data. The other data I showed you is national. Diabetes, really no change in mortality rates from diabetes. Um, some reduction from stroke, but maybe a little bit of reduction in disparities. Nothing to write home about. But this is what happens when you let people die prematurely. We end up with the whitening of the population by age. So you see that at birth, basically, you have about 18% of the population Latino and about 15% of, I'm sorry, 15% of the population African American. And you see what happens. This is the percentage of the population that's white at the top. So as people get older, the population gets whiter. Why would that happen? Because people are dying prematurely. And that's the real, if there's one graph that you should fix in your mind, we have the whitening of the population with age. People are dying prematurely. This is the number that the CDC had to have been looking at when they said, this is what's wrong. Those lines, these are the lines that should be parallel. So what is the relationship between all of this and insurance? And how do we actually, when I say inequality by design, how do we actually design this stuff into the healthcare system that makes it so bad? And the, the way we do this is we use surrogates for race, right? So we don't put up signs anymore that say blacks and whites go to two different places. What we do is we figure out what's more prevalent for people and, we, um, and one of the ways we can discriminate that really does a pretty good job at racial discrimination is we decide we to, that we can discriminate based on insurance because insurance is not a protected class, okay? You, can, you can't discriminate based on race, language, you know, all of the other um, protected classes, but you, insurance is not a protected class. So you can discriminate um, with people based on insurance. Um, and I'll get back to that in a little bit more detail. But what is, so what does it look like when you look at the distribution of insurance across our population? So what it looks like is this, that basically if you're white, 72% of whites are insured under some employer insurance, 15% um, under Medicaid, and only 13% are uninsured. But Hispanics always have the worst health insurance coverage. And so only 39% of Latinos in this country are insured by their employers. 32% are uninsured, the highest rate of anybody, and 30% are on Medicaid. So this is national data from 2011, um, which is about the most recent that you can get. And, and this is the story that it tells. And you can also look at this basically to see what relationship this has with poverty, because I told you these things sort of travel together. So 
If you look at the poor, at people who are poor, 32% of them are uninsured. If you look at the wealthiest segment of the population, you don't have to be that rich to make 400% of the federal poverty level. Only 5% of those folks are uninsured. So related to income, related to insurance. So this is, the, this is data that we got from New York. And interestingly, in New York City, um, you see that 28 to 29% of blacks, Latinos, and people who classify themselves as others are uninsured, and only 16% of whites. But if you add up people who are uninsured and people on Medicaid, you end up with a chart that looks something like this, with 61% of Latinos, almost the same as the national numbers, 52% of blacks, either publicly insured, meaning on Medicaid, or uninsured, and only 24% of whites. So if I could create a healthcare system that keeps people separate based on their insurance, I could do a pretty good job at creating a system that also discriminates on race. And, um, and so how would I go about doing that? Well, <clears throat> you can see that insurance is very closely related to people's access to healthcare and to their access to prescription drugs. And and so what we will look at next is sort of disparities in where people get care as one of the factors that contributes to um, this problem. So this is another thing I did. You can go into, if you ever want to have a little fun, um, there's this Sparks database. And this stuff's all online. Um, and you can really have some fun if you like playing with numbers, which you can see that I do. Um, and each of these bars is a hospital in New York City. So Every one of these bars represents one hospital. The black part at the bottom represents the percentage of people in that hospital that are uninsured. The yellow represents the percent that are on Medicaid. Okay? So you can see over here at this end, um, almost 90% of the people in this hospital here are on Medicaid or uninsured. And all the way down at the other end, you go down to 3.5% of people who are on Medicaid and uninsured. So you start thinking to yourself, OK, I don't get this. We're, we all live in New York City. All these hospitals are in New York City. How is it? And these blue arrows point to the public hospitals. So how is it that all of these people here are managing to like discriminate, especially the people at this end? And how do they keep people who are uninsured and people on Medicaid out of their hospitals? Like, you show up at a hospital. Do they really say, like, we don't take your insurance? Well, actually, that's exactly what happens. Um, there are lots of places where you can't get an appointment if you don't have insurance. There are lots of places where if, the, if you're on Medicaid, um, a lot of the doctors don't participate in Medicaid. And there are lots of places where um, the hospitals have chosen not to contract with Medicaid managed care plans. And now almost 90% of all of Medicaid in New York is in managed care. So you can do a pretty good job of sort of discriminating if you try. But the blue lines are what I want to point to. This, the lower blue line is the percentage of New York City people who are uninsured. So basically, everybody that's below this line here is under, everybody whose who's black bar is below that line is basically under, under caring for people who are uninsured. And everybody who's below this line is under caring for people on Medicaid and uninsured. And so if you look at the people who are actually doing their job at this, basically taking care of the percentage of uninsured and Medicaid folks in New York City, it's very few hospitals and only four private hospitals um, and all the public hospitals, um, which basically fill that gap. So that's the story of hospital care in New York. Well, it's not the whole story. The whole story is to look at who's at the bottom of the, this. So we will do a little identification here. And one of the other sad parts here is that all of sort of the single specialty um, hospitals are there. So the two orthopedic hospitals, Hospital for Special Surgery, which is at the very bottom, and Joint Disease are all at the very bottom. This represents the people at the very bottom of that prior chart. Memorial Sloan Kettering, interestingly, the place that advertises where you go first for your cancer care can make all the difference. Well. Where you go first can only be accessible to some people. And the Rusk Institute, NYU's rehab, the only, the only dedicated rehab hospital in New York City. Okay, and Calvary, the only dedicated hospice 
um, in New York City, the only full-time hospice facility in New York. All of them are at the bottom of the list. So basically, these are hospitals that where, where, where the elite folks go to get their specialized care, but aren't really accessible. And interestingly, two years ago, the, the vice president of Sloan Kettering called and asked me if I could give a presentation on health disparities to all of their assembled administrative people. So there's a room full of like 250 people, and they said, please answer these questions for us. How can we increase the number of uninsured people and people of color that we're seeing? Because we're not really seeing that many um, folks. And I said, um, well, why, why do you care about that? Well, it so happened that, the, the, that there was a change in the New York State Department of Health's approval process for new facility development. And I don't know if you've read it, but Sloan Kettering is developing facilities all over the place. And people at the State Health Department said, listen, you know, this is what you're going to do? You're going to do this in more places? I said, no, no. You've got to increase the number of uninsured people and people on Medicaid you're taking care of. So they had some good reasons why they weren't doing it. But the interesting thing was um, they asked me to get up and not talk about the problem because they already knew what the problem was. They asked me to talk about the solutions. So my first solution was if you want to get people into the hospital, you need to start playing your ads on WBLS and not playing them on WINS, which is the only place that they play their ads. And also, you've got to have an emergency room and some other, play, other ways for people to access the facility that don't have private doctors to refer them in. So, so far they haven't really made any changes. But people, people, we know what the issues are. We know how the hospitals do this. So how bad is this problem and how pathological is our system? These are hospitals that are literally a block away from each other, okay? North Central Bronx Hospital and Montefiore Moses Hospital. These, these places are actually attached by a hallway. Um, a few of us trained in these places. Um, they later, by the way, we used to wheel patients who were uninsured from Montefiore over to North Central Bronx. Now they've closed off the corridor, so now you just don't get in at all if you, um, it, you, <laughs> you just get, they wheel you out before you get into the emergency room. Jacoby and Montefiore, Weiler, Bellevue and NYU, a block away from each other. And then I thought, well, what does Harlem look like? And here's Mount Sinai, um, North General, which took care of nobody that was uninsured, believe it or not. A lot of folks on Medicaid, um, Metropolitan Hospital and Harlem Hospital, as you saw the public hospitals, you know, doing a great job at sort of filling the gap here. So do we have a system that just doesn't support that? Well, not really. What really is, is that we have a system that doesn't relate the amount of dollars it pays to hospitals for uninsured, uncompensated care with the amount of uncompensated care it gives. So this is a scattergram, again, something I pulled off of table nine and also off of a listing of all the hospitals and how much um, uninsured care, uh, how much money they got for uninsured care. So you can see like up here is a hospital that really got a lot of money and does a lot of self-pay discharges, okay? Ooh, look at this. Here's a hospital that got just as much money and didn't have any uninsured care, uh, any uninsured discharges. And people are all over the place here, right? Here's a hospital with a ton of uninsured care um, a, a lot of money and very and gets a reasonable amount of money. But look at these hospitals that did quite a bit of self-pay discharges and got like almost no money. And so there was no relationship because this was all politics. These were things that went on on the hospital's cost reports that went back decades. And nobody had ever stopped to correct this because nobody wanted to correct it because the hospitals that were being overcompensated at the top were all the powerful medical centers in the city. And the people that were at the bottom are the hospitals that you're reading about closing and stuff, the places, you know, like, uh, the, the places like Interfaith and all of those places that are in the middle of the city taking care of people who are poor and have not been able to really have the political clout to get the money they need to continue to operate taking care of such a high um, uh, number of uninsured patients. So one of the things that we focused on, because this was all stuff that we were trying to make as public as we could, was outpatient care. And many of you have heard me talk about this until you're probably sick of it. But for the one or two of you in the room that might not have. So 
the thing that we really focus on now, and actually Diane and I were, were on the phone yesterday for hours trying to uh, unravel this issue of why we're having such trouble getting our patients into specialty care here. So the problem is that Mount Sinai, like all the other major academic medical centers, operates two systems of care. It has its faculty practices for people who are well insured and its clinics for people who are on Medicaid or uninsured. And so you separate these and you basically give different types of care to people in different settings. And as a result, you end up with complete madness because different places take different types of insurance. Yesterday I was at the medical board meeting. I don't think medical board meetings are confidential. Anyway, I was at the medical board meeting. Here's, here's the, all the chairs are, all the chairs go to the medical board meeting. So yesterday, medical board meeting, the discussion is about um, how we, about some new rule that you can't, if you're not a Medicaid provider and you don't have a Medicaid number, the state says anything you order is not going to be covered by whoever it goes to. So if you're not a Medicaid provider and you write a prescription for a patient who is covered by Medicaid and they take it to the pharmacy, the, you will, the pharmacist will not be able to fill the prescription under Medicaid if it's written by somebody who's not a Medicaid provider. So you can register to be a non-participating provider in Medicaid and still be able to write prescriptions. So the president of the hospital says, well, we don't really have any authority to force doctors to, be, to, to accept Medicaid, but we do have the authority to make sure that all the doctors that, accept Medica that aren't accepting Medicaid fill out this form so that we can get paid for everything we do. And I said to the people who were around me, you know, in a too low a voice, I should have actually raised my hand. I regretted not doing it afterwards. Why can't we require all the doctors in the hospital? We're sitting in the middle of, of Harlem. Why can't we require all the doctors at Mount Sinai to accept Medicaid, at least for inpatients, at least for people that end up in the hospital here, maybe not in their private practices. We can't tell them what to do there. But why can't we tell them to do that in their practices that are in a Mount Sinai building across the street or that are in their faculty practices or whatever? Why can't we get people to do that? Why can't we get people to say, we want your practice to at least take care of the percentage of people that live in Harlem because we're an institution in Harlem. What gives us the right to sort of separate all of those people out and in fact create systems of care that aren't equal? So how do we design inequality out of the system? I don't want to leave you with just this negative view. We actually think that there's two really important things that need to be done. And the first we found out by looking at some stuff that we did internally, because it's not fair to criticize the rest of the healthcare system without looking at what you're doing within your own um, operation. So we got this CDC grant. We had all this great money for diabetes. We're getting a million dollars a year. And one night, maybe in the middle of a nightmare, I thought, wow, you know what we've never looked at? We've never looked at the diabetes outcomes of our patients by race. And we had a lot of race data, and I thought, well, you know, we do such a great job, so I'm sure that we have eliminated disparities in the outcomes of people uh, with diabetes. So we looked at this, and here's what we found out, that our patients, after years of treatment in our sophisticated system, basically ended up having unequal A1C outcomes. And we had met the enemy, and it was us. We were basically taking care of people with diabetes and not successfully eliminating disparities. And that was extremely troublesome. And some of you in the room will remember many meetings where we sat and pondered over this and tried to figure out, well, what was it that we were doing differently for people that could have been a result, that could have led to this kind of disparities? And so what we did was we ended up looking at um, sort of, uh, I think there were 18 different factors that we analyzed to see if we were doing anything different. This was just a smattering of them, but the only two that popped out as anything that we were doing different, we were doing different in the right direction. So blacks and Hispanics were getting um, more visits than whites, and they were getting more medication treatment than whites. And so we were sort of left puzzled. And then we were going through sort of looking at this stuff and thinking, well, I wonder if this is sort of um, a picture that looks a lot like other pictures. Remember this picture? And remember this picture? 
And this was our picture. People who had been in care with us for over a three-year period, this was their starting hemoglobin A1Cs, and that was their A1Cs, and everybody was getting better, but we weren't eliminating the disparities. And we had created a microcosm of what was going on in the country over decades, right? We were treating everybody, they were all getting better, but we weren't eliminating disparities. So we started thinking about models of care. And some, there were some brilliant people that had written about sort of models of care in relationship to disparities. And so he started to develop this concept, which we've now called affirmative healthcare action. It basically, and the best, the best analogy I can give is sort of an educational one. So you have two different school systems, right? You have a school system where there's a student-teacher ratio of like 42 to 1, and a school system where you have 10 kids in a class with two teachers, right? And they go through the school system from, from kindergarten up to 10th grade. And people realize in their 10th grade scores, wow, look at this. These scores are so much better than everybody else. We need to do something about that. And so what do they do? They mix them all together, and they put them all in a system of care at 11th and 12th grade. And then at the end of 12th grade, they give them the test again. And they go, my god, we didn't correct the thing. It just, it's still the same as what it looked like after 10th grade. And I thought, well, yeah, because you, you really can't correct 10 years of less good education in two years of like equal education. And I started thinking, that's exactly what we're trying to do in healthcare, aren't we? We're taking people who are uninsured, who haven't had treatment for their diabetes, and haven't had treatment for their heart disease, and haven't had treatment for their hypertension. So their blood vessels are all thickened and everything like that because they've been hypertensive for 10 years and never treated. Their kidneys, their kidney function is worse. All these things have gone on because they've come into the system at a point where we're taking care of them and trying to undo years of disparities in access and quality of care. And you can't do it that way. So you got to do something extra, which is where the whole concept of uh, affirmative action comes in, right? So what we ended up doing was not going back to medical school in 1973, <laughs> but what we ended up doing was throwing figuring out every possible thing that we could do for people who came in at higher levels of A1C to get their A1C down faster and to get on them. And we made a list of all of those things. And we put this program together with a grant, another grant from the Robin Hood Foundation. And we set up a diabetes registry, which many of you use. Um, disparity reports where we actually f tracked and looked at the, the um, A1C measures and other measures by race. We put together clinical alerts, hired diabetes educators. We did all of this stuff to say if we start, if we take people in whose A1Cs are greater than eight and we focus our energy on that group, can we reduce disparities? And I think we have what might be one of the first actual experimental models where you can, where we actually eliminated disparities, but it's not all a good story. So here you can see, these are the white patients, um, the percentage of our patients whose A1C is less than seven, and it went from like 43% up to about 46%. And these were the black patients, and they started out with a huge disparity, and you can see that over time, basically, uh, over time, my arrow is not showing up anymore. Oh, it is there? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Over time, oh, it's not on my screen. Over time, you can see that the disparity sort of went away. But why I say it's not all good news is the same thing didn't happen with our Latino patients. Well, the disparities decreased almost not at all, and the lines have stayed pretty much parallel. So now we have to go back and look at what's going on with the African-American patients compared to the Latino patients. Maybe it's an uptake of these, spe of these other things. But we actually were able to eliminate disparities by doing more for people that came in with a history of worse care. And I think that that's a really important message. We can't, the, the, the model out there and the model that we keep seeing emerge is this float all boats model. And it basically says, if you basically make everybody better, if you make everybody better, disparities will go away. That doesn't happen until care is perfect for everybody, and it's perfect starting at birth. If you start out with people who have some you know, neglected history, you can't do the same thing for everybody. You've got to do more for people who come in with, um, with a greater history of, of problems. So that's one story. 
And that's one way that we can help to design inequality out of the system, is to recognize that we have to do more for people. And that can be at the bedside. It can be recognizing that a patient that you're taking care of for the first time is getting health care, good health care for the first time when you're there at their bedside in the hospital, you know, and they haven't done that for years. Or it can be the, a person that walks into the health center and you're taking their history and you're thinking, well, here's somebody who's come in and they haven't been treated for many, many years. And what do I need to do to get them, to lift them up um, to a different level? So the other thing we need to do goes all the way back to the stuff that I did um, in medical school. And that is that we have to get this in our heads, that if we see something, we have to say something. We can't be part of these systems. And it goes on in every day of your life, okay? So Diane and I were on the phone yesterday with people in the clinics here trying to get access. For, we're looking at a, at a sheet of paper for a kid with Fidelis who was referred, I think, by, by Victor. Um, for a problem with their hand. And two weeks later, we get a notice back that says that the person couldn't be seen because they have Fidelis Healthcare. And the note at the bottom says, unfortunately at Mount Sinai, no, uh, none of our hand surgeons take Fidelis insurance. That's what the note said at the back. And when we talked to the people there, the people in the clinic said, oh sure we take Fidelis. Because these systems are so complicated. We've separated people. We let different doctors take different types of insurance in the system. So how can you possibly create a healthcare delivery system that functions that way? And that's what we have here, where every doctor here gets to decide. And, and this isn't just Mount Sinai. I'm talking about here in New York City. Every doctor gets to decide what insurance they're going to accept, even when they're part of health systems that are publicly funded, okay? A pro doctor in private practice, like Dr. Roseman. Dr. Roseman can do anything he wants in his private practice, and that's appropriate. If you're coming into a publicly funded facility that gets billions, literally, in Medicare and Medicaid dollars, how can you allow a facility like that to operate without taking care of its proportionate share of people who need care, who are covered by public insurance programs? It doesn't make any sense. And that's the kind of stuff that you have to do by publicizing this. So how do we discriminate? First of all, people of color are less likely to have insurance. They're segregated into different institutions. They get inferior care because they're on Medicaid or uninsured. We saw that in the differentiation between clinics and um, faculty practices. And hospitals get hundreds of millions of dollars to take care of these folks, but don't actually provide access all the time. So if you see something, say something. So we said something. We put out a monograph with funded through, with public funding um, through our CDC grant, and we put out a monograph. We printed hundreds, maybe thousands, I don't even remember, of copies of this in 2005, almost 30 years after the first experience that I had at um, St. Luke's. And it said, separate and unequal care, medical apartheid in New York. How do we separate people into different systems of care? And remember, if you do that, the people with the loudest voices, the people with money, with good insurance, are no longer advocating for the other people. They're in a separate system. They've opted out of that system. They're in a different place. And so what you're left with are people who, when you speak to them, feel lucky to get anything we have to offer them. They're like, they don't want to speak out because they're, they feel lucky that somebody handed them a Medicaid card that they think we paid for, but in fact, they paid for, right? And they, they feel lucky to get anything. And so we have to speak out for people like that. And this got picked up in the press. And it was only the second time that anything I did got picked up in the newspapers. And it was 30 years later. And this said, Apartheid in Apple Hospitals. I love that <laughs> title. Um, New York Post picked this up. Insurance injustices condemn the poor. They put a picture of our monograph on there. And they took those graphs that I had showed you before and they abstracted them and talked about how people were separated into different systems of care. And I would like to say that that sort of just changed the whole world, but actually it's been changing kind of slowly and things are happening. So a couple of years ago, there was the Medicaid redesign team. And fortunately, I was asked to be on the disparity subcommittee. And so we actually got this statement put into that, which is action should be taken, address disparities in treatment at teaching facilities. Action should be taken to ensure standards of care are enforced in teaching hospitals and training clinics that care provided to persons who are uninsured, Medicaid, 
privately and, and to the privately insured is consistent of the highest quality and equivalent to those services provided by faculty practices in the same institutions. Interestingly, the one thing I couldn't get in there is to say that it all had to be in the same place, which is really the key to it. You can't separate people into different locations and eliminate disparities. But we got them to at least say it had to be of the same standards. Well, right now, that's about as good as we've been able to get. But we do have legislation pending now. We have a still active, but not really anybody doing anything about it, um, complaint filed with the New York State Attorney General's Office that we did with New York Lawyers for the Public Interest to try to get them to work on eliminating disparities. And ultimately, it might just be slides like this that are going to get us somewhere. These are the national comparisons of the United States against everywhere else. And you can see we're all the way up on the right. And seven is the worst score you can get. And we got sevens pretty much up and down everything. And what I always say to people, and I love showing this slide, and I love showing other slides like this, because the one thing you never hear about when people talk about how bad we are in compared to the rest of the world is the fact that we don't have a healthcare system. We have multiple healthcare systems. And if you have 100 million people of color that are being undertreated, that have worse health outcomes, and they're being averaged in with all of the other people who are supposedly getting better care and have better health outcomes, we really have two countries. Average in those two countries, and we come out worse than all of the other European and other countries that have universal access and a lot less disparities in their care delivery systems. So until we eliminate disparities, we're not going to ever be able to raise this up because we'll always have, and we have an increasing number, right, of people of color in this, in this country every year. We'll never be able to look like the other countries until we, um, until we begin to improve this. So we have basically taken to the streets once again with public information, um, and this is really something that we can help to fix in, in the people sitting in this room because we're in healthcare. And we can say something when we see something. We can help to publicize the disparities. We can address them when they happen, like we try to do every day in trying to straighten out referrals or figure out how we're going to get appropriate care for our patients here, at Beth Israel, at Montefiore, all the places that we, that we work. Um, and we have to do this with community voices. And that's one of the things that our Bronx Health Reach program has been so successful at doing. It's engaging people in 60 churches to not only teach them how to cook more healthy and learn more about it, but to learn that when they show up in a hospital that they're unlikely to get the same quality care as other people, how to be advocates for themselves. And at the same time, while we're teaching people about that, we also teach the population. Um, we, also, we also have to change the policies so that we don't have to rely on every individual person to be such a powerful advocate for themselves to get good care. So we have to end the discrimination that exists in healthcare and make health equality a reality. And um, anybody that wants a copy of this presentation, you're welcome to have it. Just come up here, write your email address, and I promise uh, you'll have it by Monday. Questions? Yes. Okay. Um, like what process that's in, uh, what organizations are active on it, and kind of what we can do as policy or um, activists or community sure. people? So, um, so we have two things that are pending. The, the, um, this, the, the interesting thing, or sad thing, I should say, about the Attorney General's complaint is it never gets closed. So there were investigators on it for a couple of years, and we would get periodic reports. We never got anything back that said, you know, we're not doing this anymore. In fact, what we did get back were comments that said, everybody that we talk to in all of the institutions say that everything you've said is true. Nobody ever denies the facts that there are these different systems of care. The really crazy thing is that people don't really believe in health equality. That's really what we're up against. What we're up against is people who don't believe that everybody deserves the same type of health care. And so some people will say, well, what does that mean in relationship to you know, people who are wealthy? Does that mean we have to sit in the waiting room with people who 
you know, or homeless and people who are poor. Well, in every system across Europe, the people at the very top, they can buy out. You can always buy out. What it really means is we're looking for equality in the 95%, right? The 5% are going to buy out at the top. But right now what we have is 30% falling out at the bottom. And we got to fix that. So in terms of the Attorney General's complaint, nobody really, nothing's really happening with it. It's inactive. But we have legislation. And the legislation has gone through like, this will be the third year that it'll be introduced. And it's gone through some iterations because what happens when you introduce something like this that's controversial is that everybody, you know, that, that needs to maintain the systems the way they are opposes it and comes out and says, you know, we really can't change this now. It's going to take too long. It's going to be too costly. Um, but the worst parts were people who basically said that it's against the law to treat everybody in the same way. And they actually brought some laws in that made absolutely no sense. And we literally last, I guess it was not even two months ago, brought up peop, um, a woman um, who is the national, the, the national expert on Medicaid law to come and meet with Dick Gottfried, who is the set of, set the head of the Assembly Health Committee and who's offered to introduce the bill to explain to Assemblyman Gottfried how the legal arguments that were being made against the ability of institutions to put, treat everybody in the same place were all spurious and had absolutely no validity. And now we've had multiple legal opinions, basically, that do that. And these are long struggles. And one of the things we've been advised is that they're very hard to fight at the, at the level of the law because, like you know, you know there's, look, what, look what happened with the, uh, you know, with the ACA. It's like one legal battle after another, one state after another. It just goes on and on forever. People don't give up. Um, and so you know, look what happens with abortion. You know, it was made legal years ago. It's still every day you read about some state that's trying to restrict, you know, abortion access. So you end up with all of these things that get stuck in the legal system. And that's why it's going out in the community and getting the community voices that are really important. So what we need to do is we need to build this movement again. And we need to build it around what some people have called, you know, the next civil rights movement, which is to get people to all live to be the same age. I mean, what, a, what more fundamental right can you have than, than, than ending the whitening of the population with age? I mean, to me, that's like, that like says it all, right? Other questions, comments? So what, yeah. Hospitals was so, yeah. was so scattered, and I, I wondered if that's an area of potential advocacy and. Yeah. Um, so actually, effort. there's, um, that's getting better. In the last year, there was, uh, I think it was last year. Last year, there was a bill um, that passed as part of a larger package of, of reforms um, in New York State to connect the, to over a number of years, to take those numbers and average them in with numbers that were more closely related to the uninsured care. And actually, that was a positive result. I'm glad you mentioned that. That was a positive result of a lot of advocacy that uh, two or three organizations did. Um, what's uh, C CPA, the Committee for the Public Health System, um, took, they were the ones who really took the lead on that, on that issue um, over, uh, over a decade, basically, and talked about it. Um, we jumped in, and a few others jumped in. And basically, the advocacy efforts ended up getting a piece in the bill that was able to, to start to move that in a direction that's, um, that's, that's more equitable, but also required institutions to post signs at every entry point that says that if you are unable to pay, that the institution has an obligation to care for you and that you can seek help with this funding. So you can actually go into the admitting office of a hospital now, supposedly, I say. Um, go into the admitting office of a hospital and say, I'd like to be taken care of here. I don't have any insurance, and I want to access the bad debt and charity care funds or whatever you would, you know, however you would refer to them. And you can actually go in and ask for care under that, under, under that funding mechanism. And the hospitals were required under this, under this regulation that, took, that was passed a few years before this um, 
to basically post this at every entrance to the institution. Yes. Right. Are you aware of any medical models to address <laughs> pediatric, you know, health in terms of maybe avoiding some of the childhood origins of adult disease, getting to the root level so you can avoid having separate classrooms? Yeah, I mean, what you end up with, the disparity piece, and I, I took out this slide because there were just too many of them, but you can actually look at those, dis those parallel disparity lines you can look at them around educational issues. You can look at them about income. You can look at them. That, the story of disparities is the same across everything that you do. So I don't really know of any models that sort of say, you know, how you correct it. I mean, the closest thing we could think of was this model of sort of affirmative action, which basically says, you know, 20% of the, of the medical, 20% of the population is African American and only 2% of the medical school admissions. So what do you do? You do something to try to shore up the 2%, right? I mean, if you just keep doing the same old thing, you're gonna keep getting the same old results. So it's really that sort of model, I think, of affirmative, that's the only one that I can keep in my mind that makes any real sense to me. You know, other people may think of this in different frames, but to me it means, you know, that if you've started out with certain um, things against you, whatever those risks are, um, that those are the things that you have to mitigate in terms of dealing with the issues um, of disparities. But, Maxine? Speak up. Oh, yeah, that's a great example. Uh, the Harlem Children's Zone is an example of how a community based organization um, picked a geographic area and is attempting to address all of the root causes of disparities because, you know, even like for example, now we have Child Health Plus. Even every single child in New York State can enroll in Child Health Plus, documented or undocumented, and they will have health insurance, but that health insurance will not address all the, dis all the social determinants of health like housing and education and all the other things on Neil's list. But an organization like Harlem Children's Zone is saying, well, within this geographic area, we are going to try to address all of these determinants of health, from education to access to fresh foods to access to physical activity, et cetera. So it's a kind of a national model. Um, I don't know that the results are in yet. So we're going to, um, I'm going to end, but I just want to end with this. One of the amazing things about this institution is the medical students. And, you know, there's a social justice group. There's also a, a group now that's dealing with race and racism. Um, it's those voices and people getting together that really make a difference. I learned this in medical school. And one of the things that was so powerful in my medical school experience was we had a group called Concerned Rush Students that sort of grew out of these things that we were seeing in medical school. And as we would put on programs in the hospital, the people that would come were nurses, the clergy, the, the maintenance people, the, the workers you know, in the cafeteria, the people who were, um, were black and Latino, the people who could relate to these issues. We would put on these public programs in the institution. And so I've sort of been going around to the different uh, medical schools and universities kind of putting on, not this, Th this exact um, uh, presentation, but giving presentations on disparities and encouraging people to break out of the model of just having students meet with students and residents meet with residents, but to understand that there's a huge community out there of people who care about the same issues we do. They're not all medical students, they're not all residents, but they're people throughout the Mount Sinai community, throughout the Columbia community, throughout these institutions that care about these things and feel about them the same way we do. And so we have to start bringing the efforts that we're doing together so that we can create more voices for change. And I think if, you know, if I leave you with one thing, it would be that, that it, we, we have to work in concert, both with our patients individually, but also sort of with the community of folks that we take care of if we're gonna really see these things change.
So thank you for your attention. I'll hang around and answer any more questions.